Um, I think it is a basic statement about human life and our experience that we are embedded in social networks of tremendous complexity. And most people know that it matters who their friends are and who their relatives are and who their neighbors are. But in a lot of our work, what we're trying to show is that it also matters who the friends, relatives, and neighbors of your friends, relatives, and neighbors are. And in fact, who the friends, relatives, and neighbors of the friends, relatives, and neighbors of your friends, relatives, and neighbors are. We are able to show, and we think that it really matters to your life, what happens uh, to your life, uh, that it really matters when you look at what's happening in people that are one degree of separation, two degrees of separation, or even three degrees of separation from you. So events and decisions made by people far beyond your social horizon, people you don't even know, can ripple through the network and affect you. Uh, I'll give you an example in some of our work. What we've, we've shown is that if your friend's friend's friend um, gains weight, it is associated with whether you gain weight. If your friend's friend's friend quits smoking, it's associated with whether you quit smoking. If your friend's friend's friend becomes happy, it's associated with whether you become happy. So all these decisions, all these experiences that you might have in your life, which you might think were products only of your own decisions, actually depend on decisions and happenings among people you don't even know. Well, my main focus is on the health aspects of this phenomenon and how it is that our health depends upon the health of others. So most people know that their own health is affected when their spouse becomes sick. So if my wife dies, my risk of death goes up substantially. If my wife becomes sick, my risk of ill health goes up substantially. What we've been able to show is that there are numerous other aspects of my health that depend upon the health of other people that surround me. And in fact, that in a very fundamental way, health can be seen not only as a property of individuals, but also as a property of groups. That there is, when we say the health of a group, we don't just mean the health of all the uh, constituent individuals. There's a way in which we can understand health that goes well beyond understanding the health of individuals. Now, there are some economic implications of this idea even within health, and then I can allude to some other economic impl uh, implications. Even within health, what this might mean is that there are more cost-effective ways to uh, treat Ill health problems. For example, let's take the smoking cessation example. If it's the case that uh, smoking behavior um, spreads from person to person, um, so if it's the case that smoking behavior spreads from person to person to person, it would mean that money we spend getting people to quit smoking uh, affects not just the, certain, the first person, but also other individuals. And what this might mean is, from a public health point of view, uh, expenditures might be more cost effective than we appreciated, and it means that if we were to target groups, we might get more benefit. Let me give you an example. Let's say you have a certain amount of money and uh, time that you're going to spend to get 10 individuals to quit smoking. Um, and if you target these people one at a time, first you approach this person, then this person, then this person, you might be able to get three of the 10 to quit smoking. Instead, now let's say you bring the 10 people together into a group that's connected. Uh, our work shows that because of the reverberation that takes place within the network, because of the fact that people will reinforce each other's behavior, spending the same amount of money on the same 10 people, five of the 10 might quit instead of three. So now you see that by targeting the group and spending the same resources, you've been able to achieve a bigger benefit than you otherwise might have. So there might be, let's say, an economic implication, again, within a health setting. However, you asked about economics more generally. The idea of the role of social networks is a very old one in economics. Um, of course, the classic example is uh, markets. So Adam Smith talks about how, by an invisible hand, each person acting in their own interests winds up creating an efficient market. There, in a very deep sense, you can understand markets as a network property, as something that emerges from uh, network interactions. And so there are all kinds of ways, starting from that very basic idea, that we can um, take network ideas 
and apply them to fields of economics. Uh, uh, one other example that's very popular right now is in development economics, is in using networks to accelerate the diffusion of valuable innovations. So if we're trying to get a group of people to, um, to use a product, uh, or we're trying to get people to uh, use a new seed uh, in farming in a poor country, if we had ways of identifying individuals within the network that were very influential, we would rather get 10 of those individuals to start using the product than 10 other individuals. So we can use network science in, uh, in this kind of way as well. So these are a variety of examples, principally in health, but also in economics, uh, or more stereotypically economic examples of how networks might be important. I'm interested in how it is the case that something of value exists um, because of the ties. And, and one way to give an example of this, a very economic example, since I can see the kinds of uh, questions you're asking, would be to look at um, micro lending or, um, or loan collectives. The famous examples, of course, are the Grameen Bank and uh, also the Korean uh, loan collectives where people get together and uh, take turns, contribute some capital and then take turns using the capital. So um, uh, this is a way of monetizing social ties, extracting something of value. Let's say you're a trusted member of a poor community, right? That fact that everyone trusts you has some economic value. But prior to the Grameen Bank, there was no way to monetize that. But now what happens is, is a group of people get together and they vouch for me. We vouch for each other. In order for me to get the money from the bank, my five friends have to come and say, he's trustworthy. We will make sure that he repays the loan. That acts as my collateral. The social ties are my collateral for the loan. So one way of understanding um, in, in addressing the issue of human capital and social networks, one way is to say, actually, I'm not interested in human capital at all. I'm interested in social capital. I'm interested in the value of the network. However, it's also the case that one can realize that, um, that social networks uh, have an Im impact for human capital as well. That is to say, uh, where you are in the network or what kind of network you're in uh, has implications for your own human capital development. Um, so for example, it might be the case that if all of your friends are well-educated, this might influence you to become better educated. One of my favorite examples of this is a study done by an economist by the name of Bruce Sackerdote who uh, did a study where um, students at, the, at Dartmouth University in the United States were, uh, turns out, were randomly assigned to be in diff to have different roommates. And if you are randomly assigned to have a roommate that's very studious and hardworking, you become more studious and hardworking. So your human capital improves because of your exposure to other particular individuals. Well, I mean, we've been investigating a variety of phenomena uh, with respect to social networks. We're particularly interested in how things spread in social networks, how unconventional things spread. So people might not be surprised to know that fashions spread, right? What kind of clothes you wear depends on what kind of clothes your friends wear and what kind of clothes those friends, friends wear and so forth. Uh, but what we're interested in is studying the spread of things that typically people don't think of as fashions. For instance, body size. So how, how fat you are depends on, you know, could spread within a network. Um, smoking is another example. We've looked at a variety of health-related behaviors like health screening, whether people get good medical care or not, uh, drug taking, drinking, um, various foods that you might eat uh, we're looking at, um, and various emotional states as well. So James Fowler, my colleague and I, are looking at a broad set of um, phenomena that might spread in social networks. So far, James Fowler and I, Professor Fowler and I, have published two papers, one on the spread of obesity, one on the spread of smoking cessation, uh, but we have a number of others that we're working on.